So hello there, open source people, and um, especially you. Welcome to my home office uh, here in the lovely Amsterdam. Um, I am Boris van Hoytema, and I am the secretary and chief executive at the Foundation for Public Code. We're a non-profit member-owned organization that has as its mission to enable public purpose software that is open and collaborative. And of course, open source is core to this. In this talk, I would like to give some insights that I think are valuable for the entire open source community to have in order to enable public organizations like governments, public administrations, and state-owned enterprises to participate in open source and in our community. As commons management organizations and as infrastructure professionals, they seem to have obvious benefits that public administrations and public organizations can add to our ecosystem. They really add meaningful diversity. They have a lot to bring us. So in this talk, I wanna talk a bit about first, the advantages for public organizations of using and contributing to open source, why it is not happening, what you can do, and what we do at the Foundation for Public Code. Open source would be great for public organizations. And you probably already know this. And as someone from the open source world, you might even have some strong feelings about it. And yes, there's a lot that open source can give public organizations. Public organizations don't have a lot of the problems that cause companies to often don't not do open source. And some of the benefits seem to fit them even better than any other organization, like a for-profit corporation, startups, nonprofits, or even individuals. So what do public organizations stand to gain from using and contributing to open source for their most important processes? Well, three major things. And I want to start off with the first, control. Because a public organization always has full responsibility for the work they do and the services they provide. Our public administrations cannot say, well, our vendor botched a job, so now you won't get your social security, or our contracted vendor can't prioritize res restoring service to the emergency number, so everyone please hold on, uh, no emergencies right now. And it can't happen that legislation passes to enable residents to get certain rights to services that then cannot be provisioned because someone refuses to connect to databases. If the people democratically decide things need to change, they sometimes need to, regardless of what contracts have been signed in the past. As public organizations are 100% on the hook. This means that a large degree of control over the processes and the underlying infrastructure is needed. Open source can really enable this kind of control. It can enable public organizations to work with a wide variety of vendors whilst retaining the ability to lift up the hood and make the changes in themselves. Secondly, tying into that a bit, is less risk. Using and contributing to open source software takes away a lot of the risks associated with digital transformation. Not being the only user of a piece of software or a process means that if any of the users finds a problem, they can fix it for the entire community. And working in a community means the ability to have professional collaborations. For example, with people inside your own organization, and I've seen this happen a lot where open source and public administrations main first visible benefit is that actual internal collaboration gets kicked up to a higher level, as well as collaborating with other public organizations and various software vendors, as well as sometimes even residents. So this professional community means that projects are more sustainable and that it's easier to recruit new public technologists as well. In addition to this, it's been shown that using and contributing to open source leads to better, more maintainable and more secure digital services. Open source also takes away a lot of the legal issues and the risks around the software. On the more public organization specific level, there's another thing, which is that most governments have laws that specify that policy should be public and that information pertaining to any decision that is made about you can be requested. 
In some countries, all source code used by public organizations is even explicitly called out as being requestable or needing to be public. Working in open source can make those processes a lot easier and increase accountability by putting it in the foreground and preventing nasty surprises later on. For instance, having to go through a whole bunch of source code which was never meant to be published and has a whole bunch of problems in it, and specifics and details intermingled with keys and secrets, that will then be really hard later on to publish. Open source de-risks digital infrastructure on all levels, and this is seriously needed for the infrastructure that runs our societies. And the third advantage that I want to talk about is a larger effectivity. In the end, public organizations need to deliver services. These services need to be good, and they need to exper be experienced well by all residents and all local businesses. In addition, it seems that the expectation for the cost of these services is always that it must be run for next to nothing. Open source enables participants to benefit from collective innovations, making it easier to deliver modern services for less. Nobody competes on who has the best database architecture for social services, who can fix street lighting the quickest, or where their citizens can apply to a parking permit. So everyone can benefit from sharing the underlying technologies. And so this seems all clear cut. So why isn't open source in public administrations commonplace? It would be great for all of our public digital infrastructure to be running on open source. And it would be great for all of our public organizations to actively participate in open source communities as well. In addition to that, it would be great to have them contribute to the ecosystem to add their specific flavor and have their role in the maintenance of pieces of the software they rely on. They can contribute to some of their unique abilities to new open source projects as well. After all, they add a dynamic that is different from the individual, corporate or non-profit contributors that we see now and can bring new and diverse strengths to all of our projects. But it's not that simple. And it won't just happen because it's a good idea. For public organizations to become participants in the ecosystem, well, they first of all need to change themselves. However, the rest of our community can also do a lot to facilitate this transition. And for that, I would like to highlight some of the dynamics and problems with public organizations adopting open source. Of course, a commonly cited point is that public organizations and public workers are conservative. And that is definitely true. Partly because their work is so important, and partly in order to provide stability in organizations where the leadership changes every few years. So some causes for this. For the private sector, such as in companies, nonprofits, or with individuals, failure is generally quickly forgotten and successes are greatly celebrated. Whilst in public organizations, this is the other way around. Successes is seen a, are seen as the default and thus go unnoticed, whilst failure often goes severely punished. In addition to this, public organizations are bound to treat everyone equally, which of course, corporations do not. So this means that change is difficult and innovation is hard. Few get fired for walking on the tested path, even if they know it might be the wrong one. And the result is that even if all politicians and all the managers in an organization agree open source is the way forward, this might not happen. This can be seen, for example, in organizations that have politically decided to go for open source and have invested a lot of the technical know-how that's necessary for that, but still end up buying proprietary solutions. As an example, I've seen procurement staff rather use a procurement process they know well, even if they know it has problems, then use a new framework for open source procurement that they don't really know. Or they might not get the legal go-ahead because the legal team doesn't understand some of the intricacies of open source or doesn't understand how competition or state support legislation applies to it. Even if it's understood that not doing open source costs a lot more money. 
both procuring open source software for public organizations, as well as selling to them, is extra hard. And that brings us to our next problem. Public organizations are used to buying the software as a product, akin to staplers, park benches, or coffee. And for some of the software they, that they operate, this might be sufficient. However, since they have responsibilities that I talked about before, for a lot of the software they buy, this is problematic. Because some of that software is maybe more of a process than it is a product. Software that runs the processes and executes the policies of public administrations aren't purchasable in the same way as normal software, and sometimes this software is even being closer to being a law than being a stapler. Another problem that raises here is how innovation is paid for, and who takes on that risk. The current proprietary software procurement model is really based on the assumption that a vendor takes on the risks and takes on the investments on the assumption then that when they do make something work and they make something which they can sell multiple times and they make something custom for you that they can sell to a larger group, that they also get the benefits. This creates an ecosystem in which the vendors take all the risk and are expected to extract as much value as they can whenever they succeed. And this has led to a lot of distrust and significantly soured the relationship between public organizations and market parties. A working open source ecosystem works around adding value around code bases versus extracting it. So buying hours of work or service agreements becomes more commonplace instead of buying licenses. Open source instead of unlocking. And thus more of the risk of investment needs to be taken on by public organizations. Public organizations need to invest in open source development communities, its members and its future members, which is our next problem. Public organizations operate on a mandate to serve their own constituents. A city, a water board, a province, a state, a sheriff's department or a nation serves its residents and taxpayers. Having this mandate means allocating resources for developing communities around code bases is often not possible. Doing something that mainly benefits another organization somewhere else is seen as politically not acceptable, even if there are significant advantages. Investing in a community is often just flat out not allowed. I've seen this often and I've even seen, and this is fairly common, that reviewing incoming bug reports or pull requests from other organizations that are reusing your source code is often not allowed. And this plays into the isolative nature of public organizations. They often operate on their own whilst working within the framework of a higher government. They have their own processes and the jargon that comes with it. And often they believe they are the only one in the world doing what they're doing. This gets, gets shown by there being more than 500 different definitions of the term public administrations used by public administrations in North America alone. So coupled with the mandate problem, this makes it really hard to develop solutions that are generic enough for others to understand, let alone use. So these are a few of the main problems that we have, and I see these everywhere. However, your local public organizations will have their own issues, and you might be able to help with it. So what can you do? Well, first of all, it will be in all of our benefits if you support public organizations in their transitions towards more open source. We have a lot of the technical know-how, and this can benefit your local, regional, or national public organizations. And of course, all of those people will love your input. However, also, be met with, also expect to be met with some distrust. 
As I said before, the relationship between public organizations and market parties has often become a bit difficult. And thus, even with good intentions, public organizations are often very afraid of being had or being pushed into something that might not be good for them in the long run. Be honest and open with them. Clearly explain business models and stakeholder relations and how they work in open source. This can be difficult for organizations that are so used to hyper-hierarchical governance and think management is about being completely in control of everything. Of course, it doesn't work like that in open source, and you can tell them. Be patient with them, as most civil workers do what they do because they are passionate about helping society. Their responsibilities can make them stubborn at times, but they're often really willing to improve. In my experience, people in public organizations want to make sure that things are sustainable in the long term, meaning that they can work with you in order to figure out what business models you need in order for the entire ecosystem to be sustainable. So, what do we add to this mix and what do we do as the foundation for public code? Well, we started a bit more than a year ago and we're trying to figure out how to enable this ecosystem. For now, we're primarily focused on showing that public organization open source projects can be mature, multi-stakeholder, community-driven projects which both publicly and private parties involved. We do this through a set of processes that we call code-based stewardship which we've, in true open source fashion, mostly stolen from other open source foundations and adapted for use in the public organization space. In code-based stewardship, we provide code bases with the coaching, guidance, and oversight to become mature, although sometimes it feels a bit more like relationship ter therapy. We do this in roughly four domains. One, community, to help people come together and govern their assets and interactions. Two, quality, to help the community work on a shared level of quality and speak one language. Three, product marketing, to help the community grow, attract new users and contributors. Four, to connect the community and the questions and answers within. This is all in heavy development and we're stewarding it a, a handful of code bases to maturity, working with the public organizations and vendors, market parties involved. Something that, we've something that we've produced in this process is the standard for public code, which is kind of our quality level for what we believe a mature public organization open source code base should at least be. It has the quality criteria and guidance for policymakers, managers, as well as designers and developers. As we believe that developing great open source requires involvement from all these multiple stakeholders. We hope that this standard can make it easier for actors in the ecosystem to speak each other's language and trust each other as they work together. This is still at version 0.1.4 and so it's very young and we're now trying to put it into practice into multiple real-world scenarios to test its real-world applicabilities. There are also a few community projects that have adopted the standard separately from us and together with this community we're working to make a great standard. Of course, this is also something where we would really appreciate your input. Since you probably have a lot of the knowledge that we are missing, and we're welcoming your issues and pull requests on standard.publiccode.net and our community calls. So I'm going to leave it at that. And I want to thank you for sitting through this talk and the Open Source Initiative for the great work they do putting on this event, but also, of course, maintaining the open source definition and the marketing around open source. Please feel free to use whatever you can, you can find on our website or from this presentation. Uh, everything we make is mostly published in the public domain, as we really hope to kickstart a mature practice of public organization open source and invite everyone to join us in, in building this. I'm excited also, it was for really, It was really endemic of sort of the, the space uh, of public public open source uh, often it is not the 
the the the dedication of the, or the passion of the people involved that stop open source from from really being successful in the public administration but really often it's also rules and guidelines and someone in the process who isn't able to to really um uh, step out of their comfort zone to look out of the rule set that they know and and try to do something else the first question is how global is the coverage of public code.net again um, and where are the most of the organizations that you've been working with? Um, so we were founded in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, my previous job was to work with the, with the municipality of Amsterdam. And um, that is visible in sort of our practice as well. Uh, we work a lot with Dutch organizations. We work less with European organizations. We work with some organizations in, um, in Spain, in Italy, in France, and in Denmark. Um, and we've tried doing some things with, with American, um, mostly municipalities and counties, but all of that doesn't, doesn't go by itself. Um, we have looked at this space though, and one of the things that we realized is that there are quite a lot of great open source initiatives in in a lot of different countries uh, but they often get stuck at the country level because civil servants are often very much people that think inside of their own sort of like legal framework and thus find it really hard to to collaborate across borders and in that we have very explicitly made the decision that we say well if you want to do open source software development even in a local government context you should for instance use english in your development it will be more natural for most of the developers involved but it will also mean that your code base will have the ability to scale to a larger uh, scale at one point and that scale is really where the advantage of open source for a lot of public administrations comes in so we we have those ambitions of course public administrations public organizations are slow and conservative so all of this doesn't go that fast all right, um, and if like I haven't answered enough of your question, feel free to put more questions into the shared notes. Um, so where could we specifically contribute to GitHub uh, on GitHub? So this uh, the standard for public code. Um, it can be contributed to by going to github.com slash public code net slash standard, um, or you can go to standard.publiccode.net um, and you can figure out how to contribute there. Um, we uh, also all of our all of our knowledge, uh, most of our documentation is somewhere around there in that GitHub organization as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'd love to have you involved, of course. Um, so could we share the links with us here? So uh, uh, I see that one of these links has already come into the chat. Um, are there more other specific uh, links that you want shared? Then uh, I'll, uh, I can uh, add them. To the moderator, can you download the chat? The notes are being downloaded for all sessions. So I'm, I'm guessing they will be available somewhere. Um, also, anyone who would like to speak can unmute themselves with this, uh, the audio button in the button, and they can, uh, they can bring in some some things. No more questions. So I've completely saturated all of your your needs for information. I think maybe we should keep we should keep it at that then. So uh, there was one comment that um, that there were good points made about local and municipal organizations. It helps explain why a national uh, policy preference for FOSS use didn't always translate into action. Debbie says she's going to pitch a talk to the National Association of Counties on the value of open source for their digital series. Do it, Debbie. Also that, like, uh, if you want any help, um, maybe my talk today wasn't representative enough, but we have more smart people on our team and that can, that can help with anyone. And we'd always love to, to help think with these kind of things. Uh, our mission is really to enable that um, public software that is open and collaborative across the world and, and I think we also learn a lot from collaborating with others on helping our collective ideas improve um, so we're we're with this offering some like free help you think about anything um, and anyone can contact me directly uh, boris at publiccode.net 
and I would love to, to, to think with you about that. Boris has a question asking if there's any public code contacts in the UK. Are there any public code? I think I think that's maybe a good one to uh, to talk over email on because I think the the I'd be interested in like what you're trying to achieve, and then there there are many people that are are doing interesting things. Um, yeah, 